Program from Fundación Educacional Oportunidad. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the organizers, Fundación Educacional Oportunidad and the University of La Serena for connecting to this new session, a very special one where we will have teachers' perspective on the challenges education has had to face this year. Let us play an active role in this event through social media. I've already posted my selfie with the expanding opportunities hashtag. I invite you to do the same on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can also leave comments, ideas, and share your own experiences there. This event is being transmitted both through a streaming platform and Fundación Educacional Oportunidad's Facebook fan page. If you're connecting through our streaming room, please leave your questions in this section at the right side of the screen. If you're participating through Facebook, you can leave your questions in the comment section. Remember to write to whom your question is directed as we will have four different presentations in this session. I am sure all the educators out there with us today have been training themselves, learning how to use new tools, creating resources, and so many other efforts that translate into better opportunities for our students. We have right now people connecting from La Serena, Santiago, Temuco, Tiletico, La Unión, Concepcion, Vicuña, Coquimbo, Arica, Pitilemu, and also from our neighboring country, Buenos Aires. Welcome everybody. We have amazing teachers of English who have tested innovations this year in light of the pandemic to continue the learning process of their students. Thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome our poster presenters, Josefa Castro from Maule, Rocío Garcia and Ana Fuente from Barcelona, Juan Guevara from Valparaíso, Pia Irigoyen and Carolina Mata from Valle del Elqui. We hope everybody had the chance to check their posters on our website. If you didn't, don't worry, you will find the links to them in the chat or comment section as we present them. The dynamics of this session is as follows. Each poster presenter or team will have 10 minutes to share their experience with you. After the four presentations, we will have 30 minutes to address questions from the audience. So without further ado, allow me to introduce the first poster presenter of today, Jose from the Maule region with the poster, One Topic, One Song. Welcome, Jose. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Jose, but today I'm going to be just Miss Coca. <laughs> I'm an English teacher working in a small rural school in Sagrada Familia, Maule region. Colmenar de los Andes is a new school which includes English by immersion in their educational project and is aimed to kids between four to seven years old. Our school started functioning in March 2020 and it was mainly built by the teachers and the principal. After only a few weeks of actually going to school, COVID came and then we had to find a way to keep these kids who hadn't even gone to a school ever before feel motivated and connected to their school despite the fact of not physically going to it. So we needed to make them feel part of the family and music was the best way to do it. Because we have a very young student and some others that already know how to read and write, the activities that we send have to include all of them. That is why their level of complexity is going to depend on their own level. As most of you have been able to realize, planning an activity in this context is not easy. In this case, there are four fundamental areas to cover. Number one, the topic that we work has to be connected to the kids' interests. And because we only met them for a few weeks, their parents are our main connection to them and their favorite things and games. Number two, our activities have to be suitable for all ages. It is very important that we include all of our children in the project we're working on. Here, parents are also very important actors because in the end, they will mediate learning and provide the materials to do each activity. 
we have monthly talks with them and we listen and learn about them and their processes too. Three, our activities have to integrate different areas of learning. So we mix arts with science experience and songs with physical activities and games, for example. Um, number four, we have to integrate English. And that is a very big challenge because originally kids were going to be exposed to English at school, listening to their teachers speak. However, today the exposition is very hard to manage by the school. We depend on parents and their commitment to the kids' education in order to succeed. We send all the flashcards, plans, videos, songs and stories in English, but many of the instructions are in Spanish to help parents understand and support their children. So basically, what we do is that we find an interest in kids and that is very important. They are the ones who guide us in terms of content. We try to connect that to the minimum content required and to our context and community too. We find the interest and we develop it. Animals around us, for example. We present activities trying to include as many areas as we can around the same topic. So we do vocabulary of animals in English, and then classification according to their species, yoga positions of animals, an English story on a specific animal, a song about the farm, etc. If we see that there is a good response in terms of the activities, we keep on going with that topic. However, if we see that the kids lost a bit of interest, we have to change topics in order to keep them motivated and go back to the other one later on. So with that in mind, I'm going to try to explain how a week in Colmenar de los Andes works. On Monday, let's say that they find animals around them to start working with that project. While the smaller kids will only look at the animal and point and maybe make their sound, the older level will be able to make a list and even make drawings of each animal. They also make a craft of some of the animals observed, and then parents send us photos and the lists of the animals that they have observed. On Tuesday, flashcards are made using the animals that they saw the day before. We introduce vocabulary and animal sounds through a game. We send a story in English about one of the animals seen, and we ask questions about it. On Wednesday, we invite them to explore and investigate some of the animals that they have observed. They also watch a video of their classmates and themselves doing Monday's craft. They feel motivated and connected to what's happening around them. They also receive a video of their teacher asking how the week is going and inviting them to send one in response. On Thursday, Using the information of that investigation, they classify animals according to their characteristics, their food, their habitat, etc. They also practice some yoga techniques using animal poses. And on Friday, they see a song in a video of me cook. That's me. So I just learned how to play the ukulele and I started singing kids songs because one, they're easy. <laughs> And two, it's a very good way of keeping children exposed to the language while being at home. Then we realized that we could include this in our weekly plan and make it part of the process. At first, it was just me and the ukulele, but I've been learning how to edit some of the videos to make them more attractive for the smaller kids. And now they have funny gifts or even some have special uh, guests. I try to sing classic kids' songs, but I have even invented a few to match them to the topic we're working on at school. Many of those songs are on Miss Coca's Instagram, which is also the platform used to share these music videos with our students and their families. So, as we have seen, this intervention involves project-based learning. This means that our kids work on a specific topic, investigating, making interviews, painting pictures, going outside, getting dirty. <laughs> that means that kids will be able to learn about more than one subject at the same time 
and it allows us to include English, arts, science, and many other areas in the same project. We depend on documentation. These are basically photos of the kids doing the activities and one or two comments they made during the making of each activity. Those photos are sent by the parents to the teachers each day. That information will be used for documentation videos and for a portfolio that will last during the whole school process of the child. The results that we have been able to observe are mostly related to the communicative approach. I can tell how kids are trying to communicate, even if sometimes they don't have all the tools to do it. Because we receive 90% of our students' documentation at least three times a week, we are able to make documentation videos to show them that their friends are doing the same and of course, we use Miss Coca songs for that too. The simple fact of seeing their Miss, their classmates, and themselves in a video gives them a sense of belonging that holds together the bond between the child, the school, and their teachers. After applying this intervention and seeing its results, we have been able to draw three main conclusions. The first one is related to the emotions. The current health situation has not gone unseen for our kids, which is why we have to create a space of safety and happiness when we talk about education. The second conclusion is related with the communicative approach in the learning process. Kids are able to show understanding and communicate not only using their words, but using their body too. Finally, we have seen how kids and their parents have been able to learn, investigate, and explore together. They know what their kids are learning and they want to be a part of it. We depend on the parents to make this work and it is very important to keep them motivated too. They need to see that what their kids are learning is meaningful and makes sense. We invite them to go outside and learn by doing and really enjoy it. Nowadays, we also included Zoom meetings every few days. We like to see how kids are doing and they really enjoy looking at their friends for a few minutes. We have made science experiments, puppet shows, songs and games connected to the camera. Of course, sometimes it is a mess. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know it. And no one can hear a thing, but we can tell how kids really like seeing each other and their teachers. As a passionate teacher, an English lover, and a music learner, this whole experience has meant a lot. I have been able to teach and learn at the same time, and I think it makes more sense to me now. I believe that education should be connected to the nature, looking at each other, full of love and respect, making community, and sometimes being a little silly in front of a camera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josefa, for that wonderful presentation of your pedagogical proposal implemented in the school Colmenar de los Andes. As you were presenting, we got some comments. I love ukulele. They love your proposal. So uh, remember, everybody, if you have questions for Josefa, send them uh, with her name in the chat or in the question section. We have more people connecting from different places, Pitilemu, Punta Arenas, Rancagua, Viña, Talca, Ovalle, and also from uh, more people from Argentina, from Gualeguaytú, Entre Rios, Santo Tome Corrientes, and also uh, people from Barcelona. And on that note, it's time to go across the ocean and get to know an innovation from educators from Barcelona with Rocío García and Ana Fuente and their posting, Learning is Part of the Game. Hello, I'm Anna. I'm the head teacher of Play and Learn. Hello, you're a teacher of Play and Learn. Play and Learn is a language school located in Barcelona. We are trying to have fun all the time. Our classes have a lot of movements and games. We create our own methodology, implanting a lot of fun all the time learning. Kids 
teenagers and adults now that learning with us is a different experience. Coming to school is a moment that they going to learn English while they spend a good time. Now I'm gonna explain you the key points of play and learn and also I'm gonna show you some photos. The key points of play and learn are small groups to make sure there is time for all of them. Games adapted to their age and level. The order of the learning process is a speaking, listening, speaking, and writing, that is the normal process of learning our own language. Personalized advice, each student is different and we need to make sure to give a different approach to the language. A close relation to the families and teamwork with the teachers. But in February, we start to listen to some called Colorado virus. And in March, our school was closed. That was the moment where we have to move our face-to-face -face classes to online classes. And this is that way we did. In order to implement this change, we need to follow four steps. The first one was a questionnaire to the families. We use the web page SurveyMonkey to ask to the family three things. First, if they were interested in doing the classes. Second, their availability. And third, if they have a computer or laptop to follow the classes. On the other hand, we need to do a rearrange in the structure. In the language school, in the face-to-face -face classes, we have classes of one hour, classes of one hour and 30 minutes, and classes of two hours. But we thought that this length was very long for the online classes, where it was easier to lose the attention and more difficult to recover it. That's why we divide the class of one hour into two classes of 25 minutes, the class of one hour and 30 into two classes of 35 minutes, and the class of two hours into two days, one hour each day. The reduction of the time was accompanied by a decrease in the monthly payment because also the students were using their own device for the classes. The last step in this change was a change in our methodology, being this the most important modification. From now on so on, we were using the platform Zoom to do our online classes, a platform that allow us to show pictures, videos, and songs with the students. And we use Google Drive to share the files with the resources to the teachers. But as soon as we knew the service was taking up, we realized that we were some challenge to situations that we didn't need to face. For example, the first one was the teachers weren't using work to work the online platforms like Zoom or Google Drive. So the idea we offered them the training course where we could explain them the most important characteristics from this platform. The second was how to control if the students missing or they were do the technical problems. So uh, we created an action protocol where the teachers reported the missing students and we talk, it, talk directly to the families. The families had a telephone number to call in the case of problems. The other uh, thing was how to add new fun and ludic activities, which include the movements of the students so we search for the new ways to learning based on, on our online teachings. And the last one is how to know what all the lesson plans and the organization. So daily, the teachers send us an individual message of the, each class. Weekly, we did meetings with them to make changes and improvements which were necessary. After thinking a lot and solving these problems and looking for many games and activities, we could guarantee that our, that our online classes are very similar to our face-to-face -face classes. We work hard to give to the online classes the same slogan that we follow with our in our language school, learning is part of the game. To value the process of our online classes, we had two things in mind. First of all, the students, their answer in the classes, their facers, their motivation with the proposals, give us an idea about what things were working better than the others. And we could do the movements in, in order to guarantee that we are, were giving the best offer to the families and the kids. This work was with the teachers. Another thing that we used to value our process was the first certificate exam. The first certificate is an exam that is necessary in the Spanish universities. And all our students that were studying to do this exam before the problem could do before the pandemic, could do the exam after the online classes. 
And it's now when, where we would like to show you a video about the process that we did. What do we have inside? Oh. What do we have inside? Oh. Da -da -da -da. We have a cookie! Can I try it? Mm, yummy! Is the cookie sweet, sour, salty, spicy or bitter? What we have learned with all this process is, first of all, that every situation, even a pandemic situation, can allow us to grow and improve. Now we are able to offer to our students face-to-face -face classes and online classes, knowing how these two ways of learning work and taking the most advantage of them. Also, we can say that families are always very important. And here we are some advices if you want to follow this experience. First of all, spend time learning how works before how works the Zoom before uh, the classes because a good training course is one of the key of, of successful classes. After that, we have a clear idea, idea what they, they want to get. We have to we, we have the, mind, the the idea of learning is part of the game, and this is the way that we, that we work for. Another advice that we can give you is to have a good relation with the families and create a useful protocol in, in case you want to know if the students have any technical problem or if they are missing for any reason. Another advice is to arrange weekly meetings with the teacher because they are the last step of this process, but also the most important one. And finally, the best, the best advice is to work hard and know that every situation is a way of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocio and Anna, for presenting the interesting way in which your English Academy and yourselves, of course, rose to the challenge of distance education. Remember, our viewers, if you have any questions for them, please leave them in the question section with their names so that we know they are directed to them. Now we move on to the third poster of the session. Please welcome from Valparaíso, Juan Guevara, with his poster, Gamifying Current Resources, a way to engage learners to a remote learning. Welcome, Juan. Hi, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for, for joining. Thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to, to share, just to share and to, and, and to help teachers from, from this country. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to, to start off by making a little introduction. This introduction will be related to the pandemic. Uh, this pandemic or lockdown have um, affected, I would say, greatly different school communities, uh, different extent in terms of stress, connectivity, interaction, um, and a different aspect that, of course, um, it has led to take certain decisions. And in that area, uh, it is fair to say that this main problem has branches out into different categories. One of these categories being the most important one for me 
is the students. Students um, felt stressed. Uh, they are not really motivated. They are engaged. Why is, is this? Mainly it's because we're treating this context in a very normal way. We're pretending that this is a normal context, this is a normal situation. So we're sending activities, we're sending um, uh, tasks that are uh, creative, considering a normal context, but not in a pandemic context. So that is the first thing that we need to clarify. And on the other flip side of the economy, we have teachers. Teachers at the very beginning of the, of the year, um, I would say that nobody ever thought that this will occur. Nobody ever considered the, this online system. So at the very beginning of the class, I mean, of the year, we were told that we need to have lessons, virtual lessons with learners without any training whatsoever and do whatever you think is correct. In that regard, uh, I'd like to share my, um, my experience of what occurred, what I did to overcome one aspect of the many problems that we faced. First of all, in the school community where I worked, uh, the name of the school is Patricio Lynch, it's located in Valparaiso. It's a subsidized school of around 420 students. Uh, I will say that uh, the, the the students of, of this school, they have, um, I will say, a fair connectivity. Most of them have laptops and computers. So this experience is, it, it may be narrowed down to schools that perhaps share that characteristic. So that is in, very important to, to say. Uh, in that scenario, um, I started off in April with traditional activities that I, that I had to send. I'd like to share the screen just for, for a minute. So I can show you the, um, the, the pictures that I have here. These are the pictures. Sorry. So for example, um, I decided to use the, the resources that, that were given by the, by the government because those are the instruments that students have a, at hand. Um, and of course, they don't have to, to spend unnecessary amount of money uh, on, on printing, on buying unnecessary things. In that sense, I considered those instruments and I, I, and I created an instrument in a traditional way. You see, uh, activities with the score, with the time, and those uh, activities, they were uh, meant to be submitted um, after one or two weeks in which learners had to print it, um, a, write it a, with, with a traditional pen or pencil and then send it back to the teacher so I can mark it and then send it again. Um, in that way uh, is that I consider that I was treating this context, this pandemic context, as I said before, in a very normal way. So I, I had to do some adjustment because 91% of the students uh, in, in April, in, in, at the beginning of April, in, in the beginning of May, they declared to feel really stressed, not really um, eager to participate in the activities that were proposed by the teachers, in this case, English. And the average mark of the first activities that were, again, traditional method, pen and paper, uh, had an average mark of 5.5 round. The intervention uh, was the next. I consider these instruments and I adequate them in a more digital way, gamifying the resources that they have. In this way, I use platforms such as Moodle in which, for example, they may drag the, the answers and put them in the correct order, unscramble different words, Kahoot, where they use cell phones, you know, to answer activities based on a um, reading um, comprehension activity or listening comprehension activity. A Mentimeter was another platform that I used in order to propose these activities for learners in a more digital and engaging way. And by using this precisely during Zoom sessions at the very, at the very end as an exit ticket, a, I had an increased uh, in the in 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 the middle of May, uh, of 
uh, 70%, 17 percent um, having an average mark of 6.55 and releasing the stress level of learners um, in, in around 30 percent. The final um, results in that area uh, told me that only 35 learners felt stressed with evaluation with the activities and 65 percent felt really more engaged and relaxed. Why we were because we were treating the, the the activities that were meant to complete in a more dynamic and interactive way rather than an impersonal method by using worksheets that they need to print and then submit or send uh, back to the um, uh, to the emails. And in this way, we can guarantee as well that we're not working just because we have to. The, the most common word that I've not that I've heard so far is the word evidence that we need to work just because we need an evidence of what we're doing. In that sense, I strongly believe that that, that criteria has a, a decreased the level of education nowadays, just working for the mere fact of having something to show of what we're doing. I strongly believe um, that if we take that away and if we concentrate on the main purpose of giving instruments, opportunities, and um, access to um, a more engaging education to learners, regardless that this is uh, something that we may uh, 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 store just because the Ministry of Education needs to see that what we're doing is correct. Uh, I think that I can guarantee that perhaps we'll, we'll have a, 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 a more pleasant moment with our students and, of course, at the same time learning. Um, the main conclusion that I can draw from, from this is that, of course, the, the digitalizing activities provide benefits for the learners, the, the ones that I've previously mentioned in terms of the marking, the, the stress released, and of course, the, the engagement that they may show. But of course, it provides instant and automatic feedback. Uh, in that way, I think that the typical activities uh, are greatly time consuming. We spend a lot of time marking activities. And with this um, digital system that is provided by Google Forms, uh, Kahoot, Moodle, and the like, uh, we may have instant feedback and, of course, having more time to prepare a more engaging lessons for learners. That's uh, the presentation. I'm not really sure if I, if I did it correctly. Thank you so much. Yes, you definitely did, Juan. Thank you very, very much. And uh, of course, afterwards, we will have a round of questions where you can deepen more on the doubts that the people have shared. Thank you for sharing your research conducted in the school, Patricio Lynch, with seventh graders. Uh, everybody remember to leave your questions for Juan with his name so that we know who to ask. And um, I'd like to share with you that we have over 150 people connected to the presentation. Everybody's super interested in what you are presenting. We have one more poster, last but definitely not least. We are going to travel to the north of Chile, specifically to Valle del Elqui, to receive Pia Irigoyen and Carolina Mata, who will share their poster, one, two, three, camera action educational capsules for asynchronous teaching during COVID-19 in rural schools. Welcome girls. Hello everybody, I'm Piri Goyen. I'm a teacher from Paiwano. And I would like to start our presentation. One, two, three, camera action, educational capsules for asynchronous teaching during COVID-19 in rural schools. This year has been a hard year. So um, we have the need to teach to our students, but how when we are in a pandemic, we don't know exactly what to do. We have the need, we have the will. We wanted to teach our students English in a fun way as we were doing in our classes, normal classes. So um, we have a lack of connectivity, uh, low access to devices, electronic devices, and the internet is an issue here in Nepali. And also, the families are the whole day working, so our students doesn't have, don't have the support for their homework at, at home. So um, we need to have them 
learning English in a different way because they are it's not the same as in the classroom as we all know. So we um, try to be uh, fun. We try to be um, make our students happy with our capsules and also help the family be supportive with them. So that's why our proposal was to work um, with videos. Those videos were sent through WhatsApp. And we tried that those contents were contextualized to our students and, um, and the content will be relevant for them. So, for example, we decide to take some, some words, um, some units out of our idea of capsules because for their families were a little bit hard to be a part of their grandparents, for example, because they are in another town and another region. So we decided not to talk about families during this pandemic time. And we said we decided to talk about animals because animals are happy and fun for kids. So we make changes in terms of uh, prior, priorizing our students' um, emotional containment and supporting their families. And also in our videos, we have one video when we review the book up, like say, okay, you um, house, house, like things like that. But also we work with the video, with the, um, with the book. So our students we, will be working with, the, with the, the workbook, but they were with us. So the parents put the video on the cell phone and the students were looking, okay, item number one, match, match the word with the um, image. So we are there to explain to our students as we were in a class. So um, the family said that that capsule helps them a lot because they feel that they are, we are there and the parents don't need to put more effort on that because some of them don't speak English. So now they realize the potential of their students, I mean, their daughters and sons, because they are able to understand what we are asking for. Um, and also then comes the project, which is the third capsules where me and my colleague Carolina, we make a demonstration of what they have to do. So it's an example. So the family have the rubric and also an example of us doing what they, we are asking for. So they have double support. Um, as I said before, the impact that we have with our videos with our students is marvelous for us we were very emotional with this because when they receive a video they call us and i mean they send us an audio and say miss pia i miss you so much miss carolina we love you we have so much fun with your videos and that's it's very rewarding for us as a teachers because um we miss them and we are trying to make a lot of efforts to do those videos for them because we want them to learn in a fun way as we were inside the classroom. Um, and also we asked the parents to fill a survey so we have an idea of what works for them and what doesn't work. And also to as a feedback for us. And that's what we are doing, asking for them, asking them what is better. Because we as a teacher, we know what we are students need when we are inside of a classroom. But now our classroom is in each houses. So we need the parents to tell us what they need. At the beginning, they tell us they need more support with the book and also with the activities. So that's why we make some suggestions in our capsule. So what we say, uh, please don't translate this. Uh, you could follow your student with this. And that's the idea. The family feel the support of the teachers, make them feel closer to our students during these hard times, and we build a report. So now, Cairo, it's your turn. Okay, so hello to everyone. Um, well, to continue uh, with what Pia said, um, we learned a lot through this experience. Um, and we saw an opportunity um, to develop their oral skills through these videos 
And also we learn uh, to trust in our students. And that was really amazing for us because with all the support that uh, we gave them, they were able to, um, to complete all the tasks and activities. And it was really, really um, satisfying um, to see their videos. So we also um, were really careful because we didn't want to give them a bunch of worksheets, for example, or give them um, all the pages of their activity book because we know and we have to be conscious that they have other subjects also. And they have to um, respond to all of them in the same way. So um, we also learn to, um, to appreciate the family support because they are um, the tool. Uh, they give the tool to the, to the kids. Um, they facilitate them all their tools like the cell phone or the computer and they take the time to do the activities so nowadays they are not teaching they are not teachers of course we are teaching through these videos but we give them the support through in this way and we also learned through this experience to work as a team and that was really important for us. Um, it has helped us a lot. Um, coll collaborative work has been really essential. And what else? To contextualize and adapt material is also very important um, during this time. We work in a rural school, so we have to be um, conscious that kids live in a different uh, way and they relate with different things. So we, we just want to give you um, some advice. Um, it's very important, as I said, to trust in our students because they are able to work in a more independent way if we give them all the, the instructions and materials they need. And we also want to encourage you to keep um, looking for new ideas, new strategies, because that's also what coll collaborative work is about, to share ideas, right? And um, we want to tell you also that for us was very important the feedback part, because um, we take the time to send a message to all the students, one by one, and that was really, um, uh, good for them because they were so happy to see that they, their work has value. And of course, the family, um, you also um, give thanks to the families because of their support. So, um, I mean, I think we have to be um, a confident with our work. We have to trust in the students in the family during this time. And of course, we have to trust in our work because we are doing our best. We are all learning. And um, yes, now we are going to show you a, a, a short video with some of our capsules, a mix of our capsules. So I hope you, you can see it well. And we're going to see that and now.
Okay, so that was our video. So thank you so much for listening and for joining. Yeah, and Carolina, thank you very much for sharing this innovation that allows students from rural communities to continue learning English in spite of their connectivity issues. If you have any questions for Pia and Carolina, please leave them in the question section. And now we're going to start asking all of the questions you have left to our presenters. Let's begin with uh, Josefa. Let me start with the first question for you. We currently have over 170 people connected, so I'm sure they're all very interested in your thoughts. Let's see the first question. Pablo asks, how do you motivate the parents to be a part of this process? Um, thank you so much for the question. Well, I think that, I don't know, for, for the ones that are parents, we know that when they're happy and when they're motivated, it's natural in you. Like if you see your kid that has to paint a flat with his feet, he's gonna be excited and then you're gonna take pictures. And because you took the pictures, you want to send them. You want everybody else to see the pictures of your kid with paint up to his knees. So they're naturally motivated because their kids are doing something fun and they're good at it. So for me, it's, I don't know, I think it's very natural. If they see their kids happy, they want to share it. If they share it, they give us feedback, and it's a never ending circle. Absolutely, I'm sure. And um, in that same note of motivation in families and working regularly with them, Viviana asks, if the evidence uh, is sent weekly, are students or families sometimes bored sending the same type of evidence, videos and pictures so regularly? Right, so very related with that. At first, and as everybody else said, the beginning of this pandemic was very difficult. The first three weeks, the first month, it was very tiring for everybody trying to find the best way to reach them. And after, in, in our case, after we managed to have our system, um, it's, it's very natural. And, and at first they wouldn't send the pictures because they were doing a worksheet and maybe they were not too motivated to that. But if the activity they're doing is fun, and if their parents see that their kids can do a tower of blocks of, and he can climb a tree to put the last block, you want to take a picture of a kid on the top of a tree. And that's the picture we need. And we need the sentence with the, mom, I'm so high. Perfect. Like, we will see how we use that as an evaluation later. But I think that because the activities are fun and they're motivating for the kids, it's it's easy for parents to just send them. They really don't get bored. We have we had to actually ask them to send only three pictures and not 15 because our phones couldn't handle it. Have you had any families that had had some resistance to this and how have you managed that? You know what? I think at first, most of us didn't know how to manage and we have to call parents and say like, hey, you know what? I would be taking the pictures if I could because that's how we evaluate in our school anyway, but I cannot do it. I don't need you to help him doing the activity. I don't need you to do it for him. I just need you to give them the material and take three pictures of the process and one picture of the result. And once they understood that if they sent their picture, we could make a video and they would see all of the school doing the same activity, but my kid is not there. I'm going to send a picture because my kid got a little bit sad because he saw all of his classmates, but he didn't see himself in the video. So it automatically forces you to do it, I think. Right, absolutely. And it connects also with the feelings and how the student feels when they are a part of it. In that same uh, line, there is a question by Jimena. How do you promote emotional development with this methodology? So, and, and as I said it in my presentation and in my poster, for me, education is 
happiness. Like you're not going to learn if you don't like your teacher. You're not going to learn if you don't like what you're learning. You're gonna be closed like a door. But if you like your teacher and if your teacher wears silly stuff in her head, it might be funny and, and it might be something different. So if they're happy and if they're able to express what they feel, many of, their, of the activities we send, they're, they're connected with mindfulness and with the expression of the emotions and kids do some of the activities and masks and, and they understand which emotions can be felt and how to express them. We give them the space to do it. And we tell parents, like, if your kid is not feeling like painting or like singing today, it's all right. Oh, they have days. Sometimes we go off with the left foot and sometimes they do. And, and it's all right. It makes sense. So we don't push kids too hard. We just invite them. And we like to use that word a lot with them. We invite you to a Zoom meeting where we're going to make an experiment. And you're probably going to like it. But if you don't want to come, it's all right. And naturally, they come, I think. And since you're talking about enjoyment and happiness, I, I've personally seen your videos. They are <laughs> very entertaining and fun. And I would like to ask you on a personal level, how was it the process of, of learning how to make these capsules? Uh, playing the ukulele, you learned that too this year? How yes, I actually got my ukulele on December last year. And I really wanted to start singing adult songs, but they're so hard <laughs> and adults <laughs> judge. And kids' songs are easy and they don't judge. Like you do two chords and they sing and it sounds amazing. So they are the best audience. First, they're the, for me, the easiest way to reach a kid. I remember the few weeks we could go to school, I would start and the first time I brought the ukulele, I did the first, I touched the first string and your eyes open and they stopped doing everything they were doing just to look at that thing that I was holding that emitted it. Funny sound. And they want to touch it and they want to explore it. So at first it was just my pure learning of music. And then I discovered that I could mix the thing I love the most, which is teaching English with music. And I think I'm very happy doing what I'm doing and they can tell that I'm happy. So Again, the circle is they're happy, I'm happy, the parents are happy, and it all works. Absolutely. And we have one last question for mm -hmm. Jose. Carla asks, can you give us any advice to use this methodology with special educational needs students? All right. So the first answer that comes to my mind is feel the music. Let them move their foot and see what they need, basically. So we, at school, we have a few kids with special needs, um, high-functioning Asperger's specifically. And at first, it was hard for them to, to understand that there's an instrument inside the classroom, because at first there was an instrument inside the classroom, and now there's an instrument two to three times a week for the plan, uh, the, the plan that we send them. So, I think we have to, to see how they are responding to what we're giving. If they seem happy with the song, we'll keep doing that. If they seem a little bit overwhelmed with that type of music, we might try something different. But I think that it's important to keep in mind that they are the ones who decide if what you're doing is good or it isn't. Thank you. And on that interesting last uh, now we're going to move on to Ana and Rocio. We have questions for you as well. Here, uh, let me see, Catalina asks, how important was it for your experience to include the family's opinion in the beginning? You need to, yeah. First of all, we need to know their opinion to do the classes. And at the beginning, uh, we had like some problems to include the movement in the classes and they, want, they were the ones who give us 
like the solution and we work together to know to give them the best answer because also we knew that the situation was not the best one because the kids were in their houses so we were together with the parents and this is how we we did it that's why they were so important during all the process absolutely and the design included what they uh they shared with you the families shared with you yes how was it included? Um, when when we send them things and when, for example, if a kid was having problems to enter or they were late, it's when we talk to the parents and when they say, okay, but we, we forget, but we are going because they are very happy. And this is where the moment where we have the, the access and we talk to the families and we were value the process with the families. And also in the month of June, we finished the ordinary classes and we offered to the parents the opportunity to continue with the class in July. And this was, a, some of them continued during the month of July. And this was a moment also where we talked to the parents and when they say, okay, I want to continue because I'm very happy with the online classes and my kid loves to do that. So I'm going to continue. Absolutely, thank you. And you mentioned a lot during your presentation improvement, right? So was it important to have weekly meetings in order to improve? How were these meetings structured? Paula wants to know. Thank you, Paula, for your questions. The weekly meetings were important because in our methodology, uh, we change the topics every two weeks. Um, so in the meetings, we could talk about the activities who had, which had better results with the students and also which activities were working better with a specific group. Uh, when there are sometimes we have groups that, that they are the same age, but the characteristics are very different. So it were the, it was the moment, the weekly meetings. It was a moment where we talk all together, all together, and we can share our feelings with the classes and what activities were working better than the others. And with that information, we could improve the lesson plans and what we offer to the kids and the teachers for the lesson plans. Absolutely, thank you. Um, oh, we all have lots of questions for you. Javiera wants to know, how do you measure students' progress from the beginning to the end of the learning period? Um, what we used to measure is that we follow the same uh, plan that we were doing in the face-to-face -face classes. And at the end of June, that was it was when the school year finished, we arrived to the point that we usually arrive in the face-to-face -face classes. So it means that we, our, our measures and our lesson plans were as good as the other ones. And also, as we said in the poster uh, and during the presentation, our teenagers who were preparing themselves to do the first certificate exam, they could do the exam and they pass without any problem after the online classes. So this is what we all, with all this information, is that what we used to value and measure the, the online classes. Using the information as feedback so that you could improve your process. Yes, exactly. Very interesting. Um, we have another question about the students. Uh, do you use any kind of rewards with them in your online classes? We didn't use a reward as this uh, but um, we, uh, after, after some weeks of classes, we realized what activities they love it. And these are like the, the prize for them and the award for them. For example, uh, they love to run around their houses. So it was something that the parents at the beginning, they didn't understand, but it was like the reward because we say, okay, it was an activity that they like a lot where they have to find things around their houses. So they have to move and look for something and be, be the first one showing the object. And with the small ones, it could be a colors, but uh, with the other ones, we could say, we could use adjectives to look uh, for the objects. So, so this was the award, like the best game was at the end of the, of the, the class. And this what, is what they most enjoy about, them, about it. Very simple things usually work very well with children, with students, yes. 
Thank you for sharing. Uh, Belen wants to know if you use a specific syllabus to reach satisfactory levels at FCE exam. Um, yes, we create our own methodology at all the levels, but what we use is the Cambridge syllabus. So starters, movers, flyers for the uh, kids. And after that, the CAT, PET and FIRST certificate. So although Anna and me, we are the ones who create the lesson plans, uh, we follow like the contest because the objective of the classes uh, are the exams. So it's necessary to follow some contents to do it. Absolutely, thank you. And also a question about curriculum. Do you support your methodology on a specific textbook or do you develop your own curriculum? Um, we develop our own curriculum. Uh, we have traveled a lot and we have studied in different countries. So every time that we travel, we buy an English book. So it gives us the opportunity to compare different syllabus, different contests, different kinds of activities. So with all of this and with all this knowledge, we have created our own books and our own activities. So we don't follow an exact book, but we follow a lot. Even games. We, all, we always buy some games or something like that in, in different kinds in different countries. And then we, we, we use this to, and we put it in our plannings. Have you found that using this variety of resources from different sources uh, helps you improve your curriculum and the experience of the students? Yes, because also here in Europe, we study the British English and in America, you study American English. So it gives us the opportunity to share different things and also to, when we are working one topic, we look for activities, for examples, and also for different ways of explaining the things. It is also important because, uh, as I said before, for some kids, something can work very good and for the others, it works another thing completely different. So. Uh, having different resources give us the opportunity to have like different cards that we can use depending on the class. So that's why the resources can help us to improve. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience and also all of this extra information that was requested. Um, now we are going to uh, have questions for one. We also have lots of questions for you. So I'm going to go right into the first one. Cristina wants to know, what advice would you give teachers trying to incorporate more technology use in their lessons? Um, I think it, first of all, you need to be motivated. Um, if there's no motivation. I think that uh, everything that you may plan to apply to your lessons won't have any effect. That's the first thing that we need to take into consideration. The second one is trial and error. There are a lot of tutorials. There are a lot of walkthroughs in, in YouTube. There are a lot of textbooks that you may read. But the best form of internalizing a, how to uh, create a digital platform, how to um, include different links to gamify different activities is just go get to the platform, try, fail, and repeat and keep on doing it. Absolutely. And you also mentioned in your poster how technology, well, we have to use it not to be doing the same things that we were doing with the students inside yeah. the classroom, right? Yeah, definitely. Because um, I think that we have a failed a attempting to normalize uh, the curriculum as if we were in a normal, uh, in, in, in a non-pandemic context. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Um, about technology use and how technology makes things easier, sometimes you mentioned that uh, in your poster that your testing methods uh, allow you to access the results quicklier, right? Automatic. Yeah. Uh, automatic tests. So um, Lucia wants to know if that fact that you can access test results quicklier 
has, uh, has it made it easier for you to provide feedback to students? Yes, there are two different types of feedback. We have the specific feedback and of course the more general one. Uh, I think that nowadays we have a lot of runs to run. There are a lot of things that we need to do as a teacher that are not part of the class. We have to write, a, 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 create a text for parents. We need to fill in different documents for, for, for the school that are not really part of what we, are, what we need to do in the class. Um, in that regard, I think that the automatization, and not, I don't know if that word exists, but I, I think that it exists, the automatic feedback will allow us to have more time to plan a more effective lessons. And with those specific feedbacks of specific activities, we may have a, uh, the general um, uh, overview of what is the performance of learners and the, the Zoom classes that I have in my school provide a more general uh, feedback for learners in which aspects they need. I would think. Oh, stove and an oven, what's the difference between certain um, uh, idiomatic expressions and more literal ones and so on. So I think it, uh, um, 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 the, the, the feedback that is more specific, the one that we need to write notes, they may be very, very fruitful for learners. Uh, I think that according to different context, in my case, my context where I have a lot of students per class, uh, um, it is more valuable to, to do it in a more general way. Absolutely. And do you use that feedback to uh, adjust your own practices as well? Yes, definitely, on a weekly basis at least. I, it's really important to, to reflect upon what we have done so far, uh, to see uh, what are the aspects that we need to highlight, what are the main drawbacks in terms of the performance of learners, and based on that, take decisions. So I think that the magical word here in this context is being flexible. Do not pretend to cover millions of contents in just one or two or three weeks because at the end of the year they need to achieve a, per, a particular objective. I think if, if the context that we're currently facing, it's really important to motivate learners, to engage them with the class, to provide them with the best service possible uh, in a way that they may not feel stressed um, um, studying at the school. Right, and make adjustments ourselves and uh, help yeah. them adjust as yeah. well. Good. Um, in terms of technology use, and this is probably a challenge many teachers have faced, so Matias asks, how do you manage the lack of technological devices that families may have? Yes, that's um, a national problem. That's the reason when I started off this presentation, I mentioned that this experience worked in my school context, where a lot of uh, family members, uh, learners have access to technology. Unfortunately, uh, that is not really common across this country. A lot of families don't have access to technology. So in that, in, in that case, I highly recommend that teachers, school communities adapt their practices according to the context of the school context they have. Be because I don't know, maybe for rural schools, it is not the best mechanism to digitalize everything and to, to overuse internet connections. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, contextualizing is key. Yes. Uh, thank you for that comment. Pia wants to know, in your opinion, do you think gamifying is the future of education? Um, perhaps. I'm not really sure about it. Uh, um, you see that a lot of learners nowadays, uh, they spend a lot of time on the computer. Uh, they actually learn, I will say, more English out of the English class by playing or getting involved in games rather than the, in the current English class, at least in a more communicative way. Um, so in that regard, it, it, it may be the, 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 the way that is taking place in the near future. Um, but, but if you ask in a, in a more general way, a lot, of, a lot of students prefer more face-to-face -face interactions, more face-to-face -face, uh, context. 
uh, I think that gamifying activities will be good for for homework, maybe for assignment, for exit ticket, for uh, having evidence of specific objectives that you're trying to achieve. But in, in, in overall, I think that the, um, the teacher-student relationship is something that is not really easy to replace. Absolutely. But as you say, and particularly for English teaching, communication is so important that gamifying can, can help definitely the, the whole process. Yes, um, but of course there are some other areas of, of English. We have oracy, we have writing, and those are aspects that we cannot automatize. We need to observe them in a more specific way, and of course we need to provide the more specific feedback on, on that. So what I meant is that in specific context, in this particular way of observing things, in activities of vocabulary or grammar perhaps, I think it will be very fruitful to digitalize the, the questions and the activities. We're having a, a faster a feedback or overall performance of learners. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in that same line with uh, technology, they are asking, Esteban particularly is asking for recommendations of games or web pages that you use for educational purposes. Okay, the, the most typical one that I can think of um, are, is Kahoot. Uh, Kahoot is very practical. You may use the cell phones to, to get the answers and you, again, you get instant feedback of the performance of learners. You may adequate it according to a reading comprehension activity, vocabulary, grammar, if you want, I don't know. We have Mentimeter that is, a, a, it's different, but it offers the same service. Uh, we have in Mentimeter, Kahoot, we have quizzes. It's similar to Kahoot. It's more focused on tests, um, but it's a very practical tool. And we also have Moodle that I, I think that I've mentioned. It's a more, um, um, I will say, related to schools or to corporations, but it offers a tons of possibilities to digitalize activities. I think that I can think of, of those in a, in a more uh, formal way. Thank you for sharing. I'm sure everybody's taking notes of your recommendations. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Marianne wants to know, uh, and this is about community and school and how you connect with your own school. Have you got any kind of support or feedback from your school principals, teachers from other subjects, or other members of the community? Um, no, no. Uh, I think that it's something that I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation. Um, when when this COVID nineteen uh, occurred, uh, we were told to to do classes, nothing else. You just start it, do your class, and do whatever you can. In that regard, I, I haven't felt a support from my school community. I mean, not the school community, but, uh, you know, the principal, you know, and, and, and that, because um, uh, we, we didn't have any training for, for this. We didn't have any training for, for lights and activities. So in that case, I, uh, through a trial and error, I came up with the idea of making this easy because it was very time consuming to mark activities one by one when you have a class of 35 learners. In some other school, school context, there are 45 uh, learners per class. So it's tougher than that. And uh, I will say that unfortunately, unfortunately as teachers, sometimes we're really egocentric where we, we pretend to have the ultimate truth for what we're doing. So in that sense, we, we really spend some time to, of sharing as we're doing it right, right now, sharing, uh, learning, uh, adapting, uh, contextualizing, um, and, and this kind of opportunity we don't have them commonly in the school because in the school what is more important, the most important part is to uh, have the attendance, uh, to send the reports, uh, to talk to parents uh, about why are not sending the, the, the worksheets and, and the like. Well, we don't have the, the, the time for talking about uh, activities that may encourage learner to participate actively in lessons. Absolutely, everything happens so fast that everybody has been moving as fast as possible, but yeah. collaboration is definitely key to move further, right? Uh, we have one last question. Well, we had many, but I have been selecting a few 
Oscar wants to know, is there a problem in your opinion if we overuse this methodology over, uh, over time? Do you foresee any problems? It really depends. It really depends. If you force them to stay 24 seven in the computer, it may lead, may lead to a problem. This pandemic, I think is the, it's a great opportunity uh, to stay with your family. Uh, I think that this digitalization of activity is a good tool to monitor the performance on specific tasks in the English class. I'm not saying that uh, you need to send them to do activities in which they are forced to use the computer because that of course it will end it up badly. I can guarantee on that. Um, so in that sense, um, I will try to suggest that whenever you try to digitalize an activity, it needs to be short, concise, practical, and hopefully not really time consuming for both teachers and learners. Otherwise it will spend the, the whole day on the computer and, and I don't think that is really attractive for, for them. Thank you. And with that wonderful advice, thank you, Juan, for answering the questions. Now we move to the last poster that was presented. Carolina will answer some questions for us. We have received many, so I will be selecting a few so that we can discuss them. Pamela wants to know, how did you develop the model of three capsules per unit? Okay, so we start um, our work only with one video. And after doing the survey that we did to the parents, we realized that they were asking for more support uh, during the, um, their work on the book, specifically on the book. So um, there we start to um, preparing one of the videos that it's the let's practice video where they can, uh, it's a kind of tutorial where they um, can follow the activities and do it by themselves. So we just wanted to organize our work. And for that, when we started the new unit, we needed to start presenting at the same as we do um, during normal classes. So we first present vocabulary or grammar structure, and we did it in a video. Then we have this let's practice video. And then of course we need um, to evaluate, evaluate that. So we prepared this project and that's another video. So it was uh, because we needed to organize our work in a better way and to give the students more support because they are going to, they are doing it by themselves in their, in their houses. Right, so it was something you were adjusting while you were working on it. Thank you. Um, Marcos wants to know, what are the advantages of designing your own capsules for teaching? Well, I think it has uh, many advantages because you make the video more, or the, the video, yes, more significant for the students because they see yourself and sometimes um, my colleague Pia, she uses her, she dress like she used, usually does in, in normal classes. So to see, for the kids to see their teacher in a video, dancing, singing, or just acting, it's really significant for them and meaningful. And um, yeah, it has worked very well. And also, it helps you to, because you can adapt, of course, the context, the content, and you can contextualize it. Because um, you, you are making the video, you are developing and selecting the content, and what, what do, you, do you want to in, in this video? So it has a lot of advantages in, in that sense. Absolutely. We saw the video and we saw that you uh, do all kinds of things, wear costumes, and that should be very motivating for the students. And yeah. your poster is about a rural community. So one of uh, the most uh, repeated questions, Macarena in particular, asks, uh, how did you deal with the problems like 
lack of internet or electronic devices that some students may have? Well, yes, that's a reality in our, um, in our school. Uh, parents and of course, it, students don't have access to internet connection and they, not all of them have a phone or a computer. So, but at least in one, in every house, there is a phone. So um, we work through WhatsApp because it's, uh, it's free for them. So um, in that way, we can communicate with the parents and with the kids. And in that way, they send us the videos or the questions or whatever they want to ask. They can do it through this uh, platform that it's WhatsApp. And they all have this app. They all know how to use it. And that was the way uh, we did it because it was something familiar um, for all of us. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And we have some questions also about your community. So um, Carolina wants to know how many students do you have in your rural school? And Daniel will, would like to know how did you engage their families to participate? Okay, we have around 145 students, more or less, and from uh, first grade to eighth grade. And well, at the beginning, of course, it was difficult for all of for all the teachers to start motivating uh, parents because this was something new. We weren't uh, used to to talk through the phone or in this case, WhatsApp and sending evidence, sending videos. So it was a process. Um, I think the first month um, didn't work very well, but um, as all the things we get used to it, we start learning and the parents um, end to be very supportive. I mean, I think mainly because they start seeing their kids speaking in English, enjoying these videos and doing their exercises by themselves. Because most of them told us that they didn't uh, expect that their kids did the, the activity or the video. Um, so they were really amazed by seeing this, that this was really working and they kids understand their teacher and they can do the work and the activity. So I think that's of course motivation. And there is a good communication also between parents and teachers through these um, WhatsApp groups. So we try to keep a uh, contact. So in a way, families actually learned these days just how much English their students knew. Their yes. Knew. Mm -hmm. Good, and well, we have many congratulations for everybody all around. And uh, for uh, this particular poster, uh, a lot of people are asking about programs. What programs do you use? What software uh, for editing the videos or resources to, to put the images in? We have lots of questions about that. Well, we are using a lot of apps. Uh, mainly we use our phone to edit the videos and pictures. Um, so in the phone, we have um, Viva, uh, Vivo Maker. We have Video Maker also. There is another app. We use um, um, Canvas. We use for pictures. And in the, uh, on the um, computer, we use um, a program that it's called a light, there is one that is Lightroom that it's also for pictures. And there's another video editor, uh, but we try to find things that are for free. Of course, that sometimes they um, have limit, an unlimited extension, but there is one that's Video Maker, is for free and they have a lot of tools for free also, and it hasn't have uh, any limit of time for creating videos. So um, we also started using now Animaker um, 
And what else? There's a lot that you can find in the internet, but we try to find those who are for free because of course we have to uh, work with many apps and we cannot afford paying all of them. So using a variety of resources that are available to yes. all. Thank you, Carolina, for sharing. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Uh, I would like to once again congratulate and thank all of the wonderful presenters that we had today. Josefa, Rocio, Ana, Juan, Pia, and Carolina for sharing your experiences with us. Everybody remember you can download and read their posters from our website, expanding.fundacionoportunidad.cl and check the posters also for the following event, which is poster session number three at 5 p.m. today. In a little while, we can connect again and hear about more experiences. In the website, you can also find information about uh, the last event of our seminar. Tomorrow, we will have Rachel Paling at 11 a.m. with her talk, Can Language Learning Be Brain Friendly? You will also receive tomorrow a survey by email to evaluate the whole seminar, and we are very much looking forward to your comments. On behalf of Fundación Educacional Oportunidad and the University of La Serena, I thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon and see you at five o'clock. Bye-bye.